a master's in physics. So it was, an, it was applied physics and undergrad master's in physics from MIT and then a PhD from the University of Virginia. And, uh, and then he moved to NASA Ames for several years and is now a researcher at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, and he's gonna tell us about his one of several sports work, but uh, yeah. his work here on planetary defense, which I think is like an awesome way to describe the work. Uh, but uh, and and uh, and work on yeah, defending the Earth from asteroids or other dangerous objects. So um, uh, we still have a couple of people come in, but I'll give it to you All to right. take it away. Tony, welcome. All right, thanks, thanks, Danny. This is the first I've done it, so uh, you know there's going to be a lot of bit, bit, bit here. So of course, this is a great title: three uh, acronyms in in one title. That's just completely good design. AGD simulations of an if shot with Aries. So AGD means basically high energy. Oh, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna remove. Okay. All right. Okay. HED means high energy density, which means plasma stuff that's uh, fully ionized. NIF National Ignition Facility. This is the big laser that's used to. Uh, you know, run these ignition shots, basically shots to compress and burn uh, deuterium tritium plasma and produce fusion. I'm doing things that don't really exercise this. Aries, the red hydro code with lasers, which I use for modeling and designing the experiment. And currently I'm able to, it's good enough that I can, you know, compare with experimental data for x-ray diagnostics to characterize, you know, this experiment. And yes, it folds into at a several levels removed with interesting applications like nuclear detonation, ground coupling, asteroid defense, and applications I can't think of. It's the hitting a ground or any material with x-rays is what this uh, work would tie into. So I went through a little bit of this in this title slide, but here's a little preamble. Now, Aries is the main, you know, the workhorse code that I use to do all the simulation work. This is the one where either I have questions or others have questions regarding, you know, sort of the, the programmatic work that the lab is interested in. And I use Aries to, you know, answer questions like that. Um, there's lots of, I call it organized results, but there are lots of pretty pictures and movies, uh, you know, so uh, nothing else you can see, at least at a high level, the, the important physics of exactly how this thing works, how the laser hits the target, produces a lot of x-rays, and boom, there's something that we can, you know, uh, you apply to other things like asteroid defense. And um, I figured the audience, as, as you described, Danny, is it's geared towards uh, you know undergraduates and graduate students to find out you know some of the work that goes on at Livermore Labs and LLNL, especially my directorate, has a very robust uh, internship program for people who want to who decide to spend at least a summer there doing a lot of different things. Uh, you know, both physics wise as well as algorithmically, where, you know, something like an applied math background would be useful. And it could also be useful because if people want to, you know, professors or others or, want, or researchers want to learn in more detail the actual application of radiation transport, uh, not NLTE stands for non local thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, basically, the, the removing, um, Thermodynamic equilibrium as a, you know, basically a limiting constraint for atomic physics and radiation physics, and uh, the operation of synthetic X-ray diagnostics. There's all those things that actually go into this and similar work that happens all the time, 
both at NIF at Livermore and at Omega in Rochester. Now, this is a, you know, an informal talk and I, I, you know, the talks I give and the talks I go to that I feel most comfortable with are, you know, sort of back and forth ones. So if you have any questions, uh, if you want any kind of digression on anything I talk about or anything that you feel is related, just feel free to chime in and I'll just clarify it. There are no such things as dumb questions. If it's important in understanding something about what I'm talking about or the space it lives in and you feel it's important and you, you're, you have a block there, just, just feel free to ask. And, you know, there's about 40 slides in here. I don't think I'm going to through, go through all of them. They're just there uh, to see if people want to dig down. Uh, we'll go at, a, I think, a pace that everybody, I think, will be comfortable with. So it's, as I said, this whole presentation is geared towards just a, a back and forth interaction with anybody here. So the thing I'm working on, and it's kind of an interesting story, which I won't go into, but it's called Starbright. It's this campaign for which I'm a principal investigator. And... Uh, I'm just going to talk about what it is, uh, the physics we need to actually accurately simulate these kinds of experiments, and specifically the process by which we have a target that takes the laser energy from one of these, uh, uh, four of the beam, four of the 192 beams that the National Ignition and Facility uses to uh, create an efficient X-ray source. And uh, well, why use Aries and, uh, given its limitations, how I use more mature codes to fill in the gaps uh, physics-wise, or at least give myself and others confidence that even though we're missing physics uh, in, in the code that I use for this particular problem, we're not really losing anything. I'll go through the second main bullet point, just pictures and videos, the main simulation and experimental results. And at least on the slides, it's not going to be a deep dive. It's just at the level of, okay, through all this machinery, we have good enough, I guess, code performance and fidelity that we can credibly you know, compare to experiments. And um, if we have time, and it is an interesting topic because uh, interestingly enough, uh, there are codes that do sort of the more accurate physics of lasers hitting materials, uh, which requires non-local thermodynamic equilibrium processes. But it turns out that you can do it much more cheaply and yet similarly accurately with this thing called the Bousquet method. And I'll talk a little bit about one code that actually does that and show how it compares to sort of the more physically comprehensive code. So why Starbright? And it's basically a branding issue. And you know, it's, it's like working with a grant proposal committee. You don't want to antagonize them, you know, at least needlessly, unless you do, but usually you don't because they're the ones providing the money. And you know, EPEC uh, was sort of a interesting, there's an interesting story about it. Uh, suffice to say it really, uh, uh, kind of, and maybe irritated some of the older facilities and design folks. So instead of calling it EPEC Reboot, we call it Starbright, since although we're sort of in the same space, it's just a reboot of the old EPEC campaign, but uh, less angering, triggering name. <laughs> and, but of course, EPEC actually has a real, that acronym actually means something. EP refers to energy partitioning, and EC refers to energy coupling, EPEC. EC part, is the EC part, energy coupling part, is we want a high efficiency, technically high energy X-ray source for, among other things, you know, mocking scale nuclear explosives to asteroids. That is, you know, this asteroid is coming towards Earth eventually, and we want to use a nuke to basically push this asteroid uh, sufficiently off course so that you know it misses the Earth. Um, it's the second bullet point is basically the same thing, but it's sort of a more directed research proposal of, okay, what materials will actually work to to, to 
provide a good enough surrogacy. And for instance, we could have silicon dioxide or aluminum or special kind of glass targets that sort of would mock, uh, at least in scaled sense, because this is much smaller and lower energy than a new, or what would you know actually happen in space, but doing it in a the small platform that lives in either NIF, the laser facility at Livermore, or Omega, the laser facility at Rochester, New York. And the EP part, uh, which I won't really go into here, is we want roughly the same, you know, 70% uh, X-rays, 25% mechanical energy uh, division of uh, energy that goes into a new. And it's an interesting point. It has some practical applications because, uh, you know, the push that, say, a new going off by an asteroid consists of two parts. The first burst being the X-rays that illuminate and you know shock the surface as well as impart momentum, but also the debris. You know, basically because the the nuke is exploding, the debris is slapping into that material a little later. That both act to you know impart momentum to, for instance, the asteroid. So here's at a high level three bullet points of things we need. Uh, this is a laser driven experiment. So this is interesting. It's, it's really this not local thermodynamically equilibrium process. This laser of roughly visible light, you know, photon energies, but the energy density, you know, of X-ray black body radiation that hits this, you know, uh, high Z material. Um, that's, can, that's, that's this NLTE process, which, you know, hits this high Z material to produce X-rays and heat up the debris, as well as the surrounding radiation field to around 200 EVs. Now there's a similar but reverse NLTE process that we see every day, which is, you know, the sun illuminating, you know, the atmosphere and the surrounding medium uh, to infrared temperatures. And that's, that is also a similar NLTE, you know, radiation transport and atomic transition process. The, uh, we need also a fairly complicated thing called SN radiation transport. So this is the description of the radiation field, not only in terms of its energy density, but you can think of these, this, this field of uh, photon energy as a bunch of rays, uh, you know, basically it has angular dependence depending on where you look. You need a radiation field uh, of sufficient, um, basically, fidelity that contains um, directional information as well as, you know, a, a spatial and, and temporal dependence on it. And because this is necessary because we don't have a media, uh, at least for a lot of it, that's optically thick, that is ones where it's relatively opaque to the radiation that's produced. Rather, most of it by volume is uh, fairly optically transparent to most of the radiation that goes out. And so to accurately model it in practice, uh, we need this more comprehensive uh, radiation physics. In practice, what happens if we don't include that, we find out that our system is a little too good at transporting radiation uh, into other areas of problem that we know doesn't happen basically goes into these uh, transparent media like the central cavity. It'll be clear once you see, once I so, show some later slides, uh, it'll just be in, in practice too efficient if we don't include the more accurate form of radiation transport. And the, the third bullet point is we need something where uh, we have it at uh, accurate material plasma equation of state. That, that's just a, a fairly well compact way of saying we need an accurate representation of the pressure of the system as a function of its local density and temperature. In fact, that happens to be the least difficult part of the problem because we're in a regime where, or we've engineered a problem here that at least in our current expertise, we don't really exercise our uh, physical understanding. We stay at relatively low, it is a plasma, but low temperatures and relatively lo low enough densities that our understanding of the material is actually very good. Yes? Yeah, I have a stupid question. 
Sure. <laughs> well, that's not a stupid question because you need it to uh, understand. NLTE. Yes. Um, so, so I've I've heard this before. So I, I I want to try to understand. Are you saying that it's in a thermodynamic equilibrium, which is non-local? No, no, it's not in a local thermodynamic okay. equilibrium. The non velocity all three of the subs. Okay. And yeah, it should be. I know it's it's a it's it's non LTE. Non. <laughs> really, that's okay. the correct way. It's okay. not non local thermodynamic okay. equilibrium. Yes, that is true. Okay. And it's it's a process. It is the actual physical process by which this laser energy, because what is it? It's visible light. But it's not at energy densities of you know X rays, so it's obviously not in some kind of LTE state. And plus, it's directional; it's monochromatic. And this is a this is the actual physical process interacting with matter by which it's converted into X ray energy. But in other ways, I guess, <laughs> yeah, it's a simpler process, especially to people who've. Uh, you know, done plasma physics, like magnetically confined fusion, because this is ones uh, where I think people don't have a clear answer, but they're very fairly sure as if they can remove these, these processes and get the same behavior, is it has relatively subdominant electric and magnetic fields. So you don't have to worry about the process by which you have, uh, you know, charge densities and currents that produce, you know, generate local electromagnetic fields. This is a regime where the densities of the material are high enough where those processes don't really occur. Uh, there are relatively short, mean free, short enough mean free paths in this system such that ions and you know, electrons, the T ion and T mat are in local thermodynamic equilibrium and are defined by you know, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution or Maxwell distribution with ion and electron temperatures. And it's non-relativistic. So you don't have to worry about uh, you know, radiation evection terms and Doppler shifts and you know, physics of that nature. So this is all uh, a non-relativistic plasma, even when the material is sort of at the highest energy densities. Um, well, I think this is useful, at least in the sense that these are the equations solved that the uh, that the code solves. Uh, there's the constituent continuum and momentum equation. Let me just see if this pointer works. Uh, is there a pointer mode here? Uh, light is hiding right now. Okay. Well, I can go to point by point. Uh, I, unfortunately, I can't really point here. So there's, you see these four bullets, right? The first one on the top, it's D rho DT. That's the, you know, just continuity equation. Uh, you know, the density changes based on the flux of material into and out of a volume. The second point is the momentum transfer equation. How the fluid, uh, you know, how the fluid's uh, momentum density changes as both you, you uh, move uh, advanced, you know, material into and out of it. This, this second term is, you know, the advection term. And this is, you know, this change in momentum, force equals MA, the right side is the, uh, the force term, which are the pressure forces, the ion, electron, and radiation field, radiation pressure. And this funny, you know, nomenclature is because that radiation field is a tensor rather than than a scale or a diagonal quantity or, or a scalar. The four, third and fourth, very complicated, but uh, these are the important points, I think. I'll speak to those. The, uh, the ions, okay, they, can, of course, advect energy, that's the second term. There is ion work that's done on this fluid. I mean, basically PEV work, that's the third element. And the only way that energy, I mean, there are of course other physics that I'm ignoring because it turns out not to be important, but the, uh, the way that energy goes into and out of uh, the ionic component is it's uh, transferred between the ions and electrons. That's the, that's the you know, final term on the right hand side, yes? Are the electrons called mass? Yes, 
Yes, this is an, yeah, I realize this is sort of an uh, unusual notation if you haven't seen it before, but because this is, uh, it's typically the electrons that carry, you know, all the, uh, the, the temperature, um, basically the, the thermal energy in the problem, the material energy in the problem. It's, it's sort of a situation because there typically is a lot more uh, electrons, you know, electrons than ions that uh, it's, it's uh, referred to as a material temperature. That's, that's why it's called T mat. It could be T electron. It's just a point to be made that uh, the electrons are the things that, uh, you know, determine the material dynamics of, of the problem rather than the ions. Because we are typically, although it is a plasma, it's low enough, low enough energy density that it's really the electrons that dominate those, those uh, energy processes. And uh, the last one, very complicated, right? There's, a, there's the advection term similarly for the electrons. There's uh, the uh, PDV work done on the electrons. That that's, this is folded in due to you know, the, the uh, material pressure, the pressure due to the electronic component. Similarly, you know, if you get energy out of the electrons, uh, it goes to the ions and vice versa. It's just, you know, reversed. And the, the four, one, two, three, four are really the important processes that are different from what happens with the ions. The uh, Q absorb and Q laser and Q emission are basically the processes by which uh, the uh, electrons interact with the radiation field, both with the laser component as well as the, uh, the non-laser radiation field component, the X-rays that are produced. And the uh, fourth point is how uh, basically there's a not insignificant for these problems level of thermal conductivity in it. And that's this diffusion process that occurs here. So, yes? So the non-diffusion process for the ion. It's, there is a term there, but it's uh, relatively insignificant. The associated ionic, uh, you know, uh, thermal diffusion coefficient is orders of magnitude smaller. Because that's much lower. Yeah, the mass of the ions are much, much larger than the electrons. And so that's, that's the reason behind the reason. <laughs> and I'm, there's, of course, the ion, this is basically covering the ions and electrons. But the important point, too, is I will show, I mean, I could give you a, a general proof, but this is the final constituent equation. This is the uh, actual um, the um, radiation field. So in general, this is a radiation field defined by not only you know its local energy density, but also I, I see in this box here. I know it's kind of it's easier if there were a pointer, but this is a directional component to it. Not only the time. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh -oh. I'm afraid I did I break something. Maybe you can get out the mouse if you get out. Okay. That works. All right. There's some setting in Zoom where it's hidden the mouse pointer. That's okay. If you had escaped, I think maybe. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> I'm really bad at technology too. Should we try? If you had escaped, to escape something. I tried to escape. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Yeah. You do have mouse button. Oh. I... Yeah, I think it's got to hit like. Oops. Yeah, that's a good idea. It was a nice idea, I think. Maybe. Right mouse button will go back. Right mouse. Okay. All right. So it was a nice college try, but. <laughs> But they, uh, okay, so let me go back to the radiation field. Basically, what, how you can sufficiently describe it, it's really a seven dimensional function. 
uh, you know, time, three spatial dimensions, and three directional dependent. But since, you know, this is, there's no real directionality associated with some like underlying magnetic field, there's only the sort of polar angle, and it's typically defined according to some, you know, convenient coordinate system. I'll just say this, uh, basically the, the way in which the radiation field evolves is has a directional component to it, and it's defined by a source and a sink term. The source term, this eta sub mu, is the, the emissivity of this uh, radiation field. What is the thing that produces more photons of that specific you know, direction, uh, this, this uh, polar angle, or mu is, you know, I think typically, cosine theta, and uh, in an absorption term, this chi sub mu, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's just absorption due to whatever physical processes, you know, remove photons from it. And um, these are basically, uh, if you recall the previous equation, uh, yeah, these are, these are expressions. Uh, for the, you know, how radiation is absorbed, how it's emitted, and uh, the radiation field that couples into, you know, the momentum of the, of the whole fluid. And I'll show this to you because we're not going through any pr practical application of it. These are, these are really the constituent equations that uh, rad hydro codes like Aries, and I'll show you kale and hydra do to, you know, model uh, you know, the, the dynamics of these HED problems. Um, yeah. I'm sure, I don't know if you're about to talk about I had a question about like the LTD assumption there. So is that V nu of T mat? So is that some nonlinear function? Oh, actually, yeah, that yeah, that's a good point. Um, this, if you're in an LTE plasma, right? Uh, you know, even the radiation fields, emission and absorption processes are described by thermodynamic equilibrium. And the emission is black body. So that's just saying, you know, it's basically the black body emission uh, at the material temperature. Ah, I see. Okay. Yes. And the, yes, that, that is a good point. If you're in an LTE situation, that's uh, what we, that's really the nature of the emissivity, you know, how, how the radiation field produces. So LTE well, means you assume black body and non-LTE, does that mean you? That, that, reception, that uh, assumption goes away. And so it becomes much more dynamic and you have to be more careful in how you uh, uh, calculate that emissivity. Okay. Oh, okay, the up and down button seemed to work again. <laughs> And this is a, just a simple aside uh, where I'm talking about a simplified expression. It'll become more apparent because uh, here's a little secret. The code Aries, although powerful, doesn't have a real NLTE functionality in there. So this is the actual uh, equations that uh, Aries uses to solve for the radiation field because it does not do, uh, at least accurately, for this kind of problem, uh, NLTE physics. It is actual LTE. So as you can, for people with a keen eye, that expression for the emissivity, I've explicitly put out. Now, um, for the problems, the way I've looked at this problem, the uh, actual modeling that I've done, I've done it you know, in two ways. Uh, I've started off with something called multi-group diffusion, which is basically saying, uh, there is, of course, uh, the radiation field is not necessarily Planckian. Uh, it can have a, you know, basically an intensity that doesn't follow a Planck distribution. You'd solve for the intensity as a function of, of frequency separately. But the nature of that, you know, radiation field as a function of directionality follows this thing called an Eddington approximation. Now, the coefficients are. Uh, you know, you can go through the math there and I'm not going to go through it, but it has basically an isotropic component and it's just linear in, in this, uh, you know, cosine of polar angle. With SM, which is what I actually do, you know, to accurately model this problem, 
it's uh, you know you not only solve it, you solve the full discrete you know ordinates equation. That is this uh, radiation field is a function of frequency and directionality. So, all right, all this stuff. Okay, why use it? Well, point number one, and I think we're almost there, because eventually what's going to happen, we're going to have to tie to some hydro experiments that we care about. Uh, so we want to be able to model, you know, this problem, not only from that burst of x-rays from the target, you know, through the vacuum and hitting this ground, you know, illuminating the ground with x-rays and the debris slab. At early times, it's a plasma. But at, you know, after about a millisecond or so, the subsequent shock that goes into, you know, the remainder of that ground circuit is, is no longer plasma, it's a hydro material. So we have to do not only just a purely hydro experiment, but more importantly, hydro with strength and porosity. So all the features of non-plasma uh, materials that we have to care about. The nice thing about it is uh, this code, Aries, although plasma code, also has an incarnation that works in, uh, you could call it material strength mode. And it allows for a relatively transparent way of moving from plasma mode to uh, you know, just material strength mode. One of the necessary elements of it are you know, appropriate material strength equation of states, which I describe here. It can do that because it can do both. And so we're almost at the stage where we're moving on to the second part, which I, where I'm collaborating with other people. And the benefit of this is, if, since we're using one code, there's in some ways fewer things that can go wrong. Yeah. So the equation of state for the ground is that derived from known like material properties of an asteroid or something that you. Good question. Where do you get that equation? You know, we're going to start off simple and say it's something like silicate or BK7 glass, which is stuff you can put in the laboratory, you can crush it, you can use a gas gun on it, stuff like that. And that's stuff for which we're going to, you know, we have information and we can use, since we, we have that stuff, we can use that information, put it into here. And in the best case, design our experiment, calibrate our instrumentation to be most sensitive to what we think its behavior is. Uh, but yes, for an asteroid, honestly, we don't really know. It could be anywhere from something that's completely unlike, you know, silicate or silica. It could be a nickel iron, you know, composite, which is basically metal or metal with holes in it. Or it could be, you know, sort of a slushy slurry pebble, pebble and ice mixture that doesn't really have any cohesion. So you want it to work for all? all of these cases where you want to be able to adjust it. We want to be able to do, adjust it, but uh, the nice thing about ARIES is that it has, there are other codes that have the functionality to it. AO3D is another one. In fact, it's probably a bit superior in terms of its models of ground equation of state or like equa material equations of state, but uh, it is a hop to another code. And so there are things that can go wrong, wrong in that hop. If we live, if we do all the work in Aries land, you know, in two different incarnations, there's less of a, you know, uh, at least that issue tends to go away. Or if there is a problem, you can actually talk to people to hopefully get a fix. <laughs> it's, it's the nature of, you know, scientific software development work with users who need answers to experimental results. So for the plasma portion, you know, we have almost all the physics. And I alluded to that in the previous slide where I had a reduced LTE representation of the emissivity. We do have accurate laser sources. That is something with the appropriate, you know, intensity profile of the laser, the way that the laser focuses and defocuses from our target. We have, you know, radiation transport, the appropriate level, the appropriate flavor of it and plasma EOSs. The problem is uh, we to get full confidence in our results, we need non-local thermodynamic equilibrium, but it isn't there yet. 
but uh, I hope I at least show, at least convincing myself and maybe some others, that if we compare to a uh, more mature code that does have this functionality and show the congruence with its results, when with even with uh, reducing our fist, basically what I'm saying is, if we have this more mature code like Kale, the, and we run it with more of the physics and get the same results that we do with Aries, that's basically it. Then it gives us confidence, at least for this class of problems, that we can, um, that we don't have all the physics, but we're doing a good enough job, at least at this stage, to, to um, simulate, model, and design this problem. Uh, I think I'll just skip this one since this is a, this will go into details of how to mesh it, which I think since I don't talk about anywhere, it's probably not very useful. But this is what I meant. This is the down vote or, you know, second vote from this more mature code that has been, you know, tested, readily tested with all the necessary physics that, you know, gives similar results to Aries that uh, gives us confidence, at least for these problems. Aries is good enough. So I figure I'll just go through this. So we're at picture time at this point. So this is the rough design of the target that was fielded, uh, was it about uh, um, five and a half months ago now? So it was actually shot at NIF, uh, two targets. Uh, one didn't do so well, the second did much better. Uh, and this is really its shape. It's you know about a millimeter in radius. It's got a cold, a hole cut out of it that's 30 degrees, you know, this goes from zero to 150 degrees, it's 12 microns thick. It's got a little bit of tin inside it to make sure that, you know, it efficiently converts the X-ray of the laser energy into X-rays. And it's got a support cone that's gold with, you know, this shape. And finally, um, uh, it was models or at least, uh, nominally stated that, you know, the laser focus was aimed, you know, about a millimeter away from the uh, center of it, sort of where the, uh, that hole gets as small as possible. This is in comparison to this older target. It is, at least the shape is roughly similar, but whereas this newer target is some kind of tin doped plastic with a gold, you know, trumpet support cone, the old one was um, all silver. So, and this was, yeah. What, so what is the purpose of the cone? Why have the cone in addition to the hole? Good question, because the lasers, you know, it is, it doesn't have a perfect focus and it doesn't come in. Uh, let me just show you here. Let's see something like this. I hope some of you can see it. It's an actual realistic laser. It doesn't come in say like this and then, have no, no bands here. It actually has a finite you know, opening angle and has some, some sort of wings outside of the main focus. So let's say it focuses here and it gets a little bigger here. The, the benefit of having that support cone is not only to support it on the stop, but also to keep the lasers from hitting you know, this part here. So it's basically to you know, block off lasers from disrupting you know, the, this source. So this is, uh, this is something, you know, I have to point out that this is, you know, an optical laser that gets fired here. And this is something that, uh, not like the full NIF ignition experiments where 192 lasers come simultaneously. This is one where there's only four of them firing. But even there, it's delivering, you know, 10, about 10 kilojoules of total laser energy in, uh, one and a half nanoseconds. So, you know, around a terawatt of power, which is pretty amazing stuff if you think about it. But even as amazing as it is, it's simple enough that uh, it, it turned out not to be too difficult for us to schedule this shot because of how uh, deeply and heavily NIF is over-engineered. Even something that looks as amazing as this or as amazing as it would have been 
20, 25 years ago is sort of like, well, okay, yeah, uh, we don't know where you fit in, but you're not really doing all that much to the facility. So yes, we'll give you, we'll grant you some shop days. <laughs> Yeah, pretty picture time. Here's what I meant. So here's exactly what happens. Unfortunately, I can't point. The laser beam actually illuminates the target. And as you can see, one of the benefits of that support cone is to you know, keep the lasers from shooting out to the side. And what it does is it's, uh, it illuminates this part. Unfortunately, for reasons I won't really go into, I can't show you the emi emission of the x-rays, you know, through this thing, but it, you know, makes it hot. It turns out to be a very efficient x-ray emitter, and, you know, it turns off and it blows up. So on the top is the density of the material. You can see the red part here. That's just the, uh, the gold component that is, hasn't been fully, you know, basic, it's plasmified but it hasn't been fully ablated. So it still keeps most of its density. And the bottom part is the material temperature, the electron temperature. And you see it's all blue after the laser turns off because you know, the thing has basically cooled off uh, you know, completely at that time. By cooled off, it's still plasma, but it's no longer at you know, you know, the 100, 200, 300 EVs. It was when the laser was depositing all the energy into into this hold on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, the, um, the simulation is it two dimensional? Yes, it is two dimensional. So it's axisymmetric. It is axisymmetric, yes. Is this experiment, is that a good approximation for the experiment? Probably it is. But, you know, you bring up a good point because I'm not shining a ring of laser energy into it, it's actually four beams. But uh, I think it's a good enough approximation because it's on axis and the uh, you know, cone size, I guess I can show it to you here. You know, basically the focal size and the cone size are roughly the size of the individual beams, I mean, at, at the focal point. That is, I'm not losing anything by making a, I don't think I'm losing anything by making a non axisymmetric approximation or making the axisymmetric approximation because it's, I'll show you here, I, I think, you know, like sort of at the, uh, probably looks something like this. Like this is the actual, I guess, realistic profile of the focus, uh, which, you know, because it is the, the uh, size of the individual lasers in that quad are roughly, you know, not too much different from the, so the profile of that, you know, beam overall. Uh, it's, it's probably good enough for approximation. You bring up a good point because that's not necessarily the case at Omega, where we have a much larger, you know, uh, opening angle rather than like three and a half degrees here. It's closer to 23 degrees there. And furthermore, you know, the beam sizes are roughly the same. And instead of, you can show that even though it collects on the focus, by the time it hits, you know, the uh, whole ROM walls, it's already like 20, 20 degrees away. So it's less like a ring and more like four individual dots hitting it. And so an argument could be made for something like Omega, we would have to, accurately model its behavior by doing a 3D calculation, a, a limited, maybe a you know, 90 degree slice calculation rather than an axisymmetric calculation, but that's more work. <laughs> yeah. Why do you draw the beam? Is it a cross-section of the beam? Why do you draw them at squared? They don't have a, a circular, like a Gaussian beam layer. I think it's modeled as one, but, um, I looked at the, you know, at least the reports, and I, I'm not a complete expert on this, but it looks like uh, to me, uh, and people have done, you know, just basically snapshots to characterize the shape of the beam at the focus. It, there is largely this squarish component because that's what it looks like, uh, you know, uh, as it comes down through each of those, each of the lasers, it comes down as a square, squarish thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, there are, 
I'm also probably missing some details too, because there's also things called faceplates uh, that take the the uh, sort of unprocessed beam. If you don't go through some kind of polarizing filter, it, it has actually much smaller focus than this. But the problem is it has a lot more anisotropy. That is, it's a lot more speculation. It, it, you know, it's it's not as uniform in time. And so the, the benefit of the faceplate, although you make the, uh, the cross-sectional area larger, uh, you do remove you know, this sort of speckling uh, you know, problem, which will definitely kill any kind of uh, you know, performance you're trying to do with a NIF capsule. Might not matter too much about this, uh, but it's it's bad enough that you won't be able to ignite a capsule with, you know, basically a collection of laser beams with that problem. What's the role of the gold? Ah, uh, uh, the gold in here. The gold is just support. It's just something to support and to block the lasers off from, you know, going to the sides. You want all uh, the lasers. If if it doesn't go into, you know, the whole rom that you know, tinned out plastic and illuminate it to produce x-rays. You, you don't, you either want it just to be blocked by the gold or to hit, you know, basically convert into x-rays. If it goes off to the side, that is also some kind of contamination in terms of any kind of effect it might have on a, you know, an add-on target, like the ground circuit for which you want to do, you know, experimental uh, results or experimental validation. And you can focus all four of those lasers into that conical. Yeah, yeah, that you can do that. Uh -huh. How far away are they? Uh, you mean, oh, good point. Yes, yeah, so this is the NIF target chamber, which is uh, eight uh, meters in radius. So yeah, it's about eight meters. Those beams, you know, through those ports are eight meters away from a thing that is about, you know, two millimeters in size. So... <laughs> They come into the chamber, I guess, eight meters away, but are they actually generated there or are they? It's generated back in some, you know, beam line. You could think of it as some kind of particle beam line, except with lasers that's, you know, hundreds of feet long. Uh, I really should know this better, but, you know, I was also a pretty crappy astronomy TA. I didn't know the <laughs> constellations. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, it's basically, you know, all that optical magic and engineering to get that coherent high energy, you know, visible light laser. And then it's, you know, focused and synchronized into as many as 192 beams. Here, we're just using uh, one, four beams from a single quad. So 192 divided by four, is that 48, we're at 48 quads. So one, one of 48 quads that are going and driving this thing. But yeah, and those are, I can't show it to you now because it's not been reviewed and released, but there is a very nice uh, Excel spreadsheet that I've co collected from somebody else with an SVG diagram showing not only the location of each quad, but also the separation of each beam in a quad. And they're about, uh, they're about centimeters in size at the, you know, at the eight meter, you know, ports, eight meter radius ports of the target chamber. <laughs> the good questions, yes. So of course, you know, the only way this will make sense is, okay, so what, how do we know it's an efficient uh, radi X-ray radiation source? We need X-ray diagnostics that can characterize the spectral and temporal as well as total X-ray energy that come out with it. Unfortunately, we don't have anything that looks like an X-ray, an overall X-ray calorimeter, but we can get pretty a pretty good result by having these things called uh, Dante X-ray detectors. So I think there's some kind of like X-ray diode. I, they're diodes that you know collect X-ray energy. Or I'm not engineer enough to give you the real description of it. Uh, suffice to say, there's a way to, they, they have sort of frequency delineated, you know, channels, and they get a fairly accurate representation of x-ray energy 
through a finite solid angle, you know, as those X rays go through those channels, both in you know frequency space and in time. And so what I'm saying is, for this uh, you know experiment, uh, because this was the first time we did it, we looked uh, you know through the throat as well as through the outer surface. That's Dante one is referring to those two diagnostics and their relative orientation. Dante two is the one that looked, you know, through the open end, the ones where the lasers come out and it's going to actually interact with any surrounding, you know, target that it's going to hit. And Dante one is the one that looked, you know, out the throat. That's how it was set up. And importantly, I'm just going to, I know this is kind of busy, but this is the thing that's saying, well, at least at a cursory level, uh, our knowledge of this experiment is good enough that we can, you know, match uh, experimental results. That is, uh, blue is, I think, the, what is blue? Blue is the experimental result, and orange is the result of the simulation, doing this, you know, forward model of, you know, basically the emission and the opacity of this, of this uh, simulation you know, forward it, modeling it through the machinery and saying, oh, well, it turns out for, you know, the significant energetic components of the system, uh, we get a pretty good match. Uh, now, of course, we don't get perfect matches because, as you said, there might be 3D components that we're missing. This is something that's not only exposed to the most energetic components of the, of the problem, but it's also sensitive to everything else in it both the highest energy and the lower energy ones. And uh, it's uh, given all the you know, issues that we've had uh, and the assumptions that we've made in modeling it, the fact that we get a fairly good agreement is, is uh, you know, fairly surprising, but it also gives us confidence that even with the uh, assumptions that we make, the, the things we're leaving out, we get, a lot of, you know, we get most of the story. Yes? Are these frequency channels or what are the channels? So the way they work, they're uh, basically, let's see if I have something else. Yes, they're sort of gated by frequency. That is, they're sensitive to certain bands of X-ray energy. And the, uh, so yes, that's, that's basically how it works. So they're sensitive to certain bands of energy. And that's, uh, that's how, how we get basically a some kind of frequency dependent, you know, X-ray spectrum out of it. It's still more, more of an art. I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to actually talk to people when I get back on the machinery that one uses to get basically experimental or synthetic results to get an unfold. That is basically how do we get a, you know, a radiant intensity? And how do we get a spectral intensity from that? It's, uh, there's an automatic way uh, I've been told multiple times that they don't quite know how to trust it. I'm giving you a lot of the inside baseball of how work happens, you know, as a designer interfacing with experimentalists. They say, for instance, there's issues with that. So I figure for my benefit and others, well, what is the machinery that others have, you know, basically applied elsewhere to do, you know, the reverse process? What I've shown actually is the forward process. That is given the uh, the simulational output, the physics, the dynamics of this problem, you know, convolve it through a synthetic diagnostic to get a synthetic diagnostic result. But what happens in practice is you just have, you know, you have this blue curves, right? You have their sensitivities, you have the solid angles, and you have to infer some kind of radiant intensity at that detector with some confidence. And since uh, I want to better understand what's happening, since this is a diagnostic that's very important uh, to confirm whether this is a, you know, an efficient X-ray source, it behooves all of us, or at least the people in, in my team, to better understand, okay, how, how does this X-ray diagnostic work? Oh, this, this or this one? Yes, um, I have talked to some people about this is maybe there is a boo-boo in terms of uh, uh, this automatic system that contains, for instance, all like the sensitivity data, maybe they got, got it off by a factor of 10. 
you know, it's hard to get a response sometimes. <laughs> I'll tell you that uh, generally people, if, if people respond to half the questions I provide, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so it seems like in, right, there's four channels where you say that there's a good shape match. Yes, as well as shape, as well as, you know, total amount, I, you could say. So what, what does it mean that there's a match with four, but not the other one? Like sort of a bad shape match? I would say, okay, this is very qualitative, but it would be something like, I maybe, I get the, uh, you know, the limits of that peak, right? But, you know, the total value or the central part don't match like for channel number nine or, yeah, and channel number, what is it, six. Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, in terms of the interpretation of the, yeah, I, if I understand correctly, you're saying that uh, given that you get, you, you have more confidence in your simulation based off matching four of these, mm -hmm. but why not match all of them? Ah, there are, uh, that's, that's an ongoing study that we're doing right now, as well as, um, you know, modeling and designing for shots that will go at the Rochester laser in October and at NIF again in this coming January. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a good point. I think one of the productive ways that we're looking at this is understanding, you know, how, okay, what are the underlying reasons why channel nine is giving us this shape rather than the more peak shape? And it involves, you know, looking at just at those frequencies, exactly how does the plasma emit and what details are we missing shape-wise? The other way is let's use a common, you know, framework. And this is the person I'm asking questions, trying to collaborate with a tool that he has developed and others have used, which do the reverse process. The idea I'm thinking of is let's see if I can take my, you know, synthetic diagnostic results and reverse that in some converged way. It might be the case that what the inferred intensity that I get simulationally is very different from the simulational ground truth, if you can call it, because a reverse process is, is not unique. But, um, but if we have the same tool used the same way, just with different data, uh, we'll have a better idea of maybe inferring uh what's what what are the sources of discrepancy between the two it's it's you know it's it's a it's a tricky problem and one of the things that would help is using the same tool to uh you know to try to get results that we can compare to each other yeah i mean you said like sort of there's this existing sort of tail that is that does the non-local transport and, yes um non-local thermal equilibrium and does that um does that do better i guess the question you mean is, in terms of the synthetic agree? diagnostic yeah my good question, question is are you i didn't get whether it's whether it's good or bad is one question but whether it's better than the current state of the art is another question. very good question um i've asked uh you know the kale folks whether it can do something like that they said uh, maybe because all the necessary fields are there, it just hasn't been instrumented and hooked together to say give the same uh, kind of synthetic diagnostic that I get, you know, in Aries. And uh, you know, it's uh, involves hooking hooking stuff up together. And yes, it's um, it's harder to do when it's one person, <laughs> but. These are good points, and you know, uh, this is work to to be given to you know people or maybe myself as much as is possible. But yes, that's one of the things to look at because yes, kale is a more mature code. It's uh, it can actually you know run faster. It has more of the physics, um, and it presumably also has these necessary radiation fields because it can also do you know its version of, you know, unfolded intensity, 
uh, that my code does, because I've seen those results too with, with kale. And so it has similarly intensity and opacity information from which one could also create those synthetic, uh, you know, Dante diagnostics. It's just basically taking their fields that kale produces, convolving it through the same machinery to produce similar, you know, uh, per channel synthetic diagnostics and seeing what, what that produces. But yes, it's, um, it would be an interesting, interesting work for graduate students and postdocs. <laughs> Uh, what, how are we doing on time? We're past five. So I'll end with a video. I mean, we can go to the Bousquet model, but I think I covered quite a bit. I'll end with a uh, final thing. For this experiment, we also had an X-ray camera here. So something looking at it to the side to get a spatial you know, image of it, both very early, just as the lasers are only illuminating the front face, and at you know one nanosecond, when you know the lasers have pretty much illuminated the full. If you remember that video, you know the big you know solid angle of the front of the of the whole ROM. Okay, and this is you know still fairly early days. This is just in logarithmic space of this uh, camera intensities. And if you care to look, these are you know the units of that. And here's if we do it. Linearly, that is, okay, here's this illumination that we see over time. It is not quite comparable, but you know, the qualitative features, uh, well, at least some of them are there, but it's still worth exploring. You know, uh, even though the shapes are slightly different, what might be the source of discrepancy between, you know, the two shapes that we see? And, uh, you know, I think, this is probably a good place to stop. I could go if you if anybody wants to talk some more. This is I can go into the how are we confident that you know at least uh, stuff works with Aries separate from you know matching experimental results. It's at the level of well, kale gives results similar to Aries and uh, benefits of basically how kale gets a fairly good result with the appropriate or a model of the appropriate physics by using something called a Bousquet model to uh, mock up uh, non-local thermodynamical equilibrium, atomic transitions, as well as interactions with the radiation field that a more careful code does, but uh, much more slowly and using much more memory. Okay. I didn't want to ask for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure.